Good morning, everyone. I'm going to take a few more seconds to let everyone to get logged on. Hope everyone's having a great morning. Good to see everyone here today. Just give it a few more seconds. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and get started. I want to be respectful for everyone's time today. Um, good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, for everyone that doesn't know, my name is Egypt Lloyd, and I welcome you to the first meeting in 2024 of the Slave Legacy History Coalition. For those who are joining us for the first time, the Slave Legacy History Coalition is a journey in American history. The SLHC is a platform established to help connect the spokes on the wheel of history of enslaved people and their descendants pre and post emancipation. The SLHC provides a platform for descendants of slavery institutions, organizations who are engaged in preservation of history of the legacy of slavery. We encourage those who have a strong um, pertaining to the legacy of slavery to contact us at uh, info at slave, slave legacy history coalition org. Leave us a message. Tell us a little bit about yourself and we will contact you. Today marks the third year since we have established the SLHC. The SLHC holds a monthly virtual meeting on the second Wednesday of each month, and we are very excited to welcome um, Catherine Matthews of uh, Old North Illuminated. And I will introduce her shortly, um, but before I introduce uh, Catherine today, I will turn it over to Naomi uh, Gordon, who will give our announcements. And then I will introduce Paula Parrish, who also has a special announcement for you today. So Naomi, I will turn it over to you. All right, good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, to start our announcements, just a brief overview of our upcoming presenters. Uh, so next month in February, we have Kira Singleton and Joseph Bagley, um, who co-curated the um, Slavery in Boston exhibit at Faneuil Hall. Um, and then after that, in March, we have our hybrid event with the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, thank you for everyone who filled out that brief survey um, for us to coordinate our logistics. That was very helpful. Um, and as we start to finalize details, we will send that out to you guys. Um, and then in April, we have Paula Bagger from the Hingham Historical Society. Um, and then for events in the community on Sunday, January 28th, we have a presentation by Hidden Jamaica Plain um, titled Slavery in Jamaica Plain. Um, that'll be at First Church in Jamaica Plain um, and also on Zoom. And then on February 12th at 6 p.m., we have a special event um, presented by Slave, His Slave Legacy History Coalition, First Church Cambridge and Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters, National Historic Site, um, named 10 Million Names, Slavery in Descendant Communities of New England, Introducing 10 Million Names, Recover, Restore, Remember. Um, so that's basically introducing um, the 10 Million Names Project um, launched by American Ancestors in 2023. Um, so all those events I'm going to put in the chat, including any Zoom links um, and all those details. And I'm going to pass it back to Egypt. Great. Thank you, Naomi, for giving us those announcements. Now I will take a moment to let Miss Paula Harris uh, to give a special announcement um, to everyone. Paula? Thank you, Egypt. Um, it is my pleasure to announce that um, the Cambridge School Committee at its last meeting of the calendar year 
December 19th, uh, voted and resolved to rename the Vassal Lane Upper School as the Darby Vassal Upper School. And if you have, um, uh, this is a process that has actually started about 10 years ago, but I've only been, uh, I only discovered that two and a half years ago when I started looking into what might be what might be necessary. And then I thought once once I met the um once I met the Lloyd family, I thought, well, if um if they're not interested in this, then I'm not gonna I'm I'm not gonna do this. But needless to say, they were very enthusiastic. And if you'll indulge me, I'm going to whip through the resolution. There are a lot of whereases and a couple of, of, of resolved, uh, but it was voted unanimously on, on December 19th. And um, it's really been, it was a very historic moment. So let me start. Whereas last year, the school committee decided to rename the Vassal Lane Upper School to honor Black Canterbridgeans rather than someone who enslaved others. And whereas the superintendent and principal engaged the staff, students, and families at Vassal Lane Upper School in a process to suggest potential names. And whereas the students share their thoughts about the qualities that they wanted to honor, I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to truncate this a little bit, uh, whereas the students presented numerous possibilities for names, whereas community members, particularly representatives from the Slave Legacy History Coalition and the Cambridge Black History Project, reached out to school committee members to suggest renaming the school after Darby Vassal. Whereas after securing his liberty from enslavement with the Vassal family, Mr. Darby Vassal went on to be civil rights and educational justice leader, petitioning the state legislator for funding to educate Black children. And whereas Mr. Darby Vassal was outspoken about human rights his entire life, including as a six-year-old declining unpaid work for General George Washington, and through his work founded the African Society and the New England Anti-Slavery Society. And uh, whereas Mr. Darby Vassal and his family chose to keep the name, the surname of the enslavers, resolved that the Vassal Lane Upper School be renamed the Darby Vassal Upper School and be it further resolved that the students of the school will learn about Mr. Darby Vassal's life and work and be it further resolved that former copies of this resolution be prepared by the executive secretary to the school committee to be presented to the Slave Legacy Coalition and to be displayed in the new Darby Vassal Upper School Building, which will be completed in the fall of 2025. So, and I want to thank those of you on this call who have also supported this effort. It's been a very interesting, a very interesting, and um, I'm happy to say rewarding process because we got something at the end of it. So thank you. And thank, thank you, you for much. the time. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you for your, all your work. Yeah. <laughs> I second that. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, beautiful. Thank you. Um, we appreciate you. Um, I am so excited to introduce our speaker um, who was gracious to give us her time today, um, Ms. Catherine Matthews. Um, I hope everyone had the chance to have opportunity to, to read Catherine's background information. Um, Catherine comes well prepared to tell us the hidden history of the Old North Illuminated. Um, and Catherine is the Director of Education at Old North Illuminated where she oversees the planning, creation, and implementation of on-site programming. And Catherine has been on staff at ONI for six years, having joined in 2017 as co-director of education and acted as interim executive director from January to June of 2020. So Catherine, it is an honor to have you today. And we are so excited to hear your presentation. And um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Egypt. Thank you, Dennis and Naomi and Marika. Um, I am honored to be here, uh, especially given the roster of amazing speakers you've had in the past and who are coming up soon. So um, thank you again. 
As Egypt said, my name is Catherine Matthews, and I am the Director of Education at Old North Illuminated, and I'm going to start sharing my screen now. So uh, I will admit to being less than the most brilliant um, proficient, <laughs> lacking in proficiency, I guess, with technology, as my colleagues know. So uh, let's all hope this goes well. And there we go. Okay. And... There we go. Okay, I'm hoping you all can see this. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I am the Director of Education at Old North Illuminated, which is a secular nonprofit entrusted with the interpretation, preservation, and education work um, at the Old North Church in Boston. My talk is going to cover three main sections. First, I'm going to give everybody a little bit of a um, refresher on Old North in case you're not as familiar with it as um, I am. Uh, and secondly, we'll talk a bit about the shift in our interpretation that began in 2019. And thirdly, I wanna share some of the stories that we now tell at Old North because they're important and because I love to tell stories. So. Let's get going. Old North is located in the north end of Boston. It is one of the 16 Freedom Trail sites. Um, Old North is a nickname. Uh, it is formally called Christ Church in the city of Boston, and it is the oldest standing church in Boston. Old North was founded in 1723, as a Church of England parish or Anglican church. And that meant that it was a minority church of faith, um, given that most of Boston was congregational or Puritan. Um, Old North is an active Episcopal church and they have a vibrant and devoted congregation today. But all of that, as really interesting as it is, doesn't explain why are we on the Freedom Trail and why is Old North famous? And that comes down to two things. Um, first is a lantern signal, and the second is a poem. So, April 18th, 1775, two lanterns were shown from the steeple of the Old North Church. And you can see the steeple in the picture on the screen. And those lanterns were hung at, um, uh, due to a, a plan devised by Paul Revere and carried out by Old North Sexton, Robert Newman, and a member of the congregation and vestry, Captain John Poling Jr. This was a very brave act. And when that signal went up, it alerted people that the British troops were on the move to Concord, and more specifically, that their path was going to take them across the Charles River before they continued their march toward Concord. And of course, that signal did work and a whole network of riders, including eventually Paul Revere, were alerted and they spread the word and the following morning, the battles of Lexington and Concord um, ignited the American Revolution. In 1860, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a poem called Paul Revere's Ride. And in it, Longfellow was seeking to activate um, the people. This was the cusp of the American Civil War. He wanted people to realize that individuals have power to change history and to affect their community. And so he chose Paul Revere's Ride as a topic for his poem. And many of you may be familiar with it, um, it contains a very famous line that describes the, the, the lantern signal itself. One if by land and two if by sea. Old North sees approximately 200,000 people a year. And actually we think that this year we will surpass that number. Um, our visitors come from all over the world. There are family groups, there are tour groups, there are school groups. And when they come, they want to come into the church. They want to hear the story of the lantern signal. They want to understand about Revere. They want to go into our bell chamber and down into the crypt. They want to visit the historic Clough House, which is a small brick building on our campus, where until 2020, 
was located the extremely popular program called Captain Jackson's Historic Chocolate Shop. And that brings us to the story of the shift in our interpretation. So let's go back to 2012. That was the year when we at Old North started a brand new program called Captain Jackson's Historic Chocolate. Costumed interpreters shared with visitors, they demonstrated the process of the production and preparation of a colonial chocolate drink. They would describe how cacao was harvested and dried, how it was winnowed, how the cacao beans were toasted and then later ground with spices, how that mixture was then dried into cakes that were grated and eventually frothed with hot water to create a very spicy chocolatey drink that was hugely popular in the colonial era. Our visitors loved this program. They loved it. And they often asked us, well, who's Captain Jackson? Is that a real person or did you make him up? And the answer was he was a real person. Newark Jackson was an 18th century member of the congregation who owed, owned Pew 13. Um, he was a husband and a father of three. He was a merchant. He was a sea captain. And he was a chocolatier, which was a person who um, prepared cacao and made this um, this type of chocolate that could be used for the chocolate drink. In 2016, we connected with um, Dr. Jared Ross Hardesty, who had just published a book called Unfreedom. And in that book, Dr. Hardesty mentioned Jackson, which was, you know, very startling to us. He also mentioned that Jackson was an enslaver. We immediately amended our, our interpretation to include this information and to recognize um, Wareham, Boston, and Siller, who were the three people enslaved by Newark Jackson. Um, certainly what Wareham and Boston were, were working in as skilled labor in Jackson's shop, and Siller may have been in the shop. Um, she may have also been in, in the Jackson home. Within a couple of years, we received funding to do more research into Jackson's life, but also into Jackson's death because he died um, in a mutiny. And Dr. Hardesty became the principal investigator. As a result of transnational research conducted by Dr. Hardesty and his team, documents were uncovered that were related, believe it or not, to insurance claims and lawsuits associated with this, um, this voyage and also with the mutiny and Jackson's death. Um, as you'll see in the lower right side of your screen, that document there is one of those doc is one of the documents that Dr. Hardesty's team found. It's written in Dutch. Um, it is a listing of the cargo that was on the ship. Uh, the bracketed part, those three separate entries that are indicated by the bracket, are 13 enslaved children and two enslaved adults. The numbers associated with those entries are the values that were associated with them. Now, Jackson clearly was a human trafficker, but he was not working independently. Jackson, in fact, was a member of a smuggling and human trafficking ring that involved four other men who were donors or congregation members of Old North. Now, faced with this information, we decided that we needed to proceed with complete transparency and take responsibility for this history. And also that it was time that we had to revamp our interpretation, not, not just the chocolate program, but we needed to weave information about how the institution of slavery underpinned much of Old North's history um, throughout our interpretation of the site. So this all was happening in 2019. And we all know what happened in 2020. 
So this slide is a whirlwind tour of the last few years, which I'll be going into in slightly more detail. So in 2020, our site, uh, like many other historic sites, was forced to close due to the pandemic. We were closed for 13 months. Um, during that time, we were extraordinarily fortunate to receive a grant from the National Parks Foundation, which enabled us to fund a strategic planning process. We spent months on this, and in spring of 2021, we had finalized a five-year strategic plan, which included a new mission and a new vision for Old North Church, or Old North Illuminated more, more properly. The plan prioritizes inclusive, research-based interpretation of our site. Additionally, in 2021, we were incredibly fortunate to be awarded two separate National Endowment for the Humanities grants, which had many, many uh, ramifications for us. But the two that I wanna talk about were the development of a site interpretive plan, which if you're not in the museum business, um, let me describe it as a kind of blueprint for how you talk about your site. Um, what themes, what stories, and how they're going to align, how that tapestry is going to be woven throughout um, the entirety of your site. And we were really fortunate to work with some incredible consultants on that. Um, and secondly, to do work to uncover the stories of 18th and 19th century Black and Indigenous congregation members, both free and enslaved. Uh, we shifted at this point our chocolate program into the digital realm, um, and we felt that that was a much better place to dive into the nuance and complication of that story and developed two free uh, multi-unit digital curricula that relate the story of cacao and colonial chocolate, um, the, its place in the Atlantic trade, and the involvement of skilled and la enslaved labor in this industry, particularly in Boston. In 2022, Dr. Jamie Crumley, who's currently with the University of Utah, joined us for a one-year research fellowship. And her work um, into uh, recovering and uncovering the stories of our 18th century and 19th century Black and Indigenous community members has been presented in an award-winning a video series called Illuminating the Unseen, which you can access through our website um, in public lectures, and it has been incorporated into our day-to-day -day tours and interactions with our visitors. Um, also, it has been incorporated into new exhibit in our church, which opened at the very end of 2023 and was founded by the Yaki Foundation for, um, so these panels are the really best practices in accessibility, but also they of course tell the story of the Lantern Signal and Revere, but they present a far more comprehensive, inclusive, and sometimes challenging telling of the story of Old North from its founding into the 20th century. So how do we do this? How do we share this information? How, what are the new stories that we tell? And in some ways, it's because our visitors come to us already excited about our building. They come to us wanting to see that steeple and they're primed and prepared to hear the history of our site told through, in a sense, its architecture. So we use our architecture to help continue that story. If you walk into Old North, the first thing you will see, and I imagine the vast majority of you would be curious about and wanna ask questions about the seating. And you can see a picture of it taken from the second floor of our box pews. Most of our visitors go, what's the deal with these, these strange pews? Why are people sitting in cubicles? What, what is this about? And in a nutshell, box pews were a 
stream of income, a revenue source for the church. They look unusual to us. They would not have been unusual in the 18th century. But box pews, um, the process of this was that if you were a congregation member, you purchased your pew. And with that came certain rights and certain responsibilities. Um, you made this initial payment of the pew, but you were also committing to an annual fee that you would be paying. And you promised that you would be making a contribution every time that you came to church. So as I said, it's an income stream. But from an interpretive perspective, talking about the box pews enables us to begin to talk about social hierarchies, about status, and about wealth, and about the sources of wealth. Because many of Old North's 18th century congregation members had acquired or accumulated wealth or in the process of accumulating wealth because of the way that the slave economy underpinned the Boston economy. So some like Newark Jackson had enslaved people laboring in their businesses and homes. Others were perhaps importing crops um, or products that were dependent on the use of enslaved labor. But no matter what, it's in, it was we felt very important to recognize that the wealth that enabled the construction decoration of this church and the purchasing of these pews and ongoing philanthropy often came from this economy of enslavement. Now, once we begin telling that story, it is a natural progression. Many of our visitors will then say, okay, okay, so if those are the people who sat downstairs, then what? who sat upstairs? Who sat in, in that balcony? So the gallery, which you can see in the picture on the upper right, um, has its own complicated history. There were, yes, some pews, children sat up there too, but the stories we tell up there are of the 18th and 19th century Black and Indigenous congregation members who sat in that space. And that is what I would like to talk to you about. I'd like to tell you some stories. I'd like to tell you about people and about families and about what research has told us about their joys and about their struggles. The so Old North is very fortunate to have extensive, extraordinary archival materials, 300 years of history. Um, those records, plus other records that we have accessed, give us the outline of the Cranky family. They were a Black family who was part of the Old North community for three generations. And on this slide, you can see um, the names of the members of the family and also a list of some of the types of documents that we used um, to better understand their story. Chronologically, we first meet Alderman Cranky, the patriarch. In the last will and testament he prepared in 1741, Alderman Cranky was a sailor and he was a free black man. He begins his last will and testament with a very stark acknowledgement that as I am bound to see and being very sensible of the dangers thereof, first, I bequeath my soul into the hands of Almighty God. And a few lines later, we can read, item, for the love and goodwill that I bear unto Lydia Whitby of Boston, I do give and bequeath unto her, in the case of my decease, all my estate. Well, Alderman didn't just give Lydia all of his earthly possessions and claims to them. He also named her the executrix of this will, should it need to be executed. And that is a statement of love and faith and trust. The good news is that Alderman Cranky did come back from this sea voyage. And when he returns, we can find in the archives the happy news of a wedding. 
In December of 1742, Alderman Cranky and Lydia Woodby were married at Old North Church. A little over a year later, on February 28th, 1744, the Crankies had their daughter Mary baptized at Old North. Now, sadly, Alderman Cranky died in late 1746. But to continue their story, when we come to 1765, we find another marriage record and that the one I'm talking about is indicated by the red arrow. Mary Crank, whom we believe is Mary Cranky because spelling was imaginative and flexible in the 18th century. Mary Crank is listed as marrying a man named Timothy who was enslaved by Alexander Chamberlain um, a member of the Old North Congregation. The use of the, ser of the word servant, which is indicated um, in the top line, S-E-R-V with the superscript T, is a euphemism. Timothy was enslaved by Alexander Chamberlain. We have other records that show that Timothy was baptized very shortly before the wedding. And I'd like to pause here and invite everyone to just use their imagination for a second. Where did Mary and Timothy meet? Is it possible that they met attending church services together? Is it possible that in that gallery, a community was forming, a community that allowed this relationship to bloom and to flourish? We don't know, but... It is a question to ponder. The final document that we have related to the Cranky family is another baptismal record. Um, in 1773, a child named, whoops, um, Rosanna, let me get us back to that, um, named Rosanna is baptized and she is identified as the daughter of Mary Crank, just Mary. So what happened to Timothy? Were he and Mary still together? We, we don't know. And the records don't tell us. Or maybe we just haven't found the records yet that will tell us the rest of this story. So moving on. Another family whose story we share is the Humphreys family. Um, they show up in multiple places. There are several baptismal records. Um, there are alms or poor account records, um, death record, and also indenture records. Um, John and Elizabeth Humphreys had eight children. They, um, the, there are records of four different baptismal ceremonies over the course of 1747 through 1751. And here we see one of them. This is from 1750. Um, you can see that Richard, Thomas, James, Catherine, who's identified as an adult and Elizabeth were all baptized on the same day. And again, let's, let's take a moment because I think it's important to, to stop and think about why would John and Elizabeth Humphreys have chosen to be part of this church and chosen to make their children part of this church. I mean, faith, yes, clearly, primarily, probably. Community, I think, also played a big role here. But perhaps there was also the fact that being a member of an established church with a well-known and well-respected minister provided a degree of security or even protection in the greater Boston community. There are multiple records of John and later Elizabeth Humphreys receiving alms from the church. From this, we know life was hard for them. We don't know what kind of work John did or Elizabeth for that matter. Um, was he a laborer? What opportunities to work did John find? Um, did he work at the docks near the North End where they lived? We don't know, but we do know that they had a very large family. 
and it was expensive to raise and support those children. We also learned something about John and Elizabeth Humphreys in a kind of roundabout way. Uh, there was a death record of an indigenous woman named Jerusha Will. And it mentions that she died in the home of the Humphreys in the North End. Jerusha Will had been baptized into the Old North community very shortly before her death. It was likely a deathbed um, baptism. Did the Humphreys meet her at church? Did they know her prior to this? Um, but no matter how they met, I think this simple fact allows us to infer something. This family, which often struggled to have enough, felt that they had enough to bring someone into their home. And they certainly cared enough to bring a woman into their home for her last days or weeks. The Humphreys were kind. We know that John died likely at some point between 1751 when we have um, his name listed in the baptismal record of the youngest child, Ruth, and 1752 when we begin to see Elizabeth in the alms records. What was life like for Elizabeth? How did she manage her grief and also the day-to-day -day responsibilities of raising her children? Somehow she kept things together for several years, but eventually Elizabeth appears to have fallen deeper into poverty and her situation caught the attention of authorities. So, here we see the 1757 indenture record of six-year-old Ruth Humphreys. She is being bound out under the authority of the overseers of the poor. Three of her brothers, Robert and Thomas and James, had been similarly indentured the year before. For those who are not familiar with the term indenture, um, very simply put, it's a system in which a person was contractually bound to another person and in exchange for their labor, um, they received training in a trade and room and board. Uh, in the case of children of impoverished parents like Elizabeth Humphreys, it was within the authority of the overseers of the poor to take those children and to put them under indenture. Ruth was bound out to Alexander Chamberlain and his wife. She was to learn the art of being a spinster, which we might guess meant she was learning general household skills that might or might not have included spinning. Um, two of her brothers, Thomas and James, were also indentured to Chamberlain, but in his sailmaking business. And if that name is ringing a bell, that's because Alexander Chamberlain is the man who enslaved Timothy, Mary Cranky's husband. One of the witnesses to this contract is a woman whose name is Elizabeth Cutler. That is the name of the wife of the rector of Old North Church, Timothy Cutler. Was the indenture in some way conceived as an attempt to protect the children by keeping them within the circle of Old North? We don't know. If that was the case, were the children at least able to see their mother on Sunday at worship service? Again, we don't know, but I personally hope so. Ruth's indenture was to last until she was 18 years old. And again, I find so many questions here. Did she know how old she was? Did she know when her birthday was? Would she have been told when it was she was 18 and that the indenture contract had been fulfilled? What happened to Ruth and her brothers, the rest of the family? The records as yet do not reveal that story. And I wish I had time to tell you so many other stories. Um, and I will encourage you here to please come to Old North so we can share them with you. I would love 
to tell you about Beulah Speen, whose life story demonstrates how race is a social construct. I would really enjoy telling you about Primus Hall and his wife, Phyllis, or Phoebe rather. He was the son of Prince Hall. I would delight in telling you about the Reverend William Levington, who was the first black minister to preach at Old North in 1833. But I don't have time for that, and I'm sorry about that. So what I will say in conclusion is, while Old North gained its fame because of a lantern signal shining from its steeple, the 300 year history of this church is, and its people, is far, far more complicated and challenging. Our interpretation embraces the story of Revere and the Lantern story because it is a seminal story of the American Revolution. But our interpretation also embraces complication of the people and the long history of Old North. We encourage our visitors to see that history is not a dry and settled thing, but it is the accumulation of fact upon fact and story upon story. And it is evolving and it is shifting and it is ultimately helping us understand where we are right now. So I wanna thank you all for your time and attention and patience with my tech glitch. Um, I've put together here a little list of where you might learn more. And I will start by saying, please visit us. Um, check our website for when we're open. Right now we're doing pop-up hours, but we open for the season next, I think toward the end of next month. Um, also, we'll be having a play, a revival of a play this summer. I encourage you to come. Our online resources are ever growing. You can see all of Dr. Crumley's videos. There's also um, another video series called 99% Sure. There's an episode about the Humphreys family. Um, we have a blog series, which covers a lot of, of this history. For educators, if any of you are teachers or no teachers, we offer several free digital curricula and learning resources, including a high school curriculum called Cacao and Colonial Chocolate and a fifth grade curriculum, Chocolate as a Lens to the Past. So easy to get. You fill out a Google form. We give you access. We are there to support you. And finally, for researchers, whether you are professionally a researcher or you are a, um, an aficionado of history and research, Please, Old North's 300 years of materials are available at the Massachusetts Historical Society upon request. And we would love it if you researched and found your stories of Old North and shared them with us. So I want to thank you again for your time and I will stop sharing now. Wow, wow. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine. What an amazing presentation. And thank you for being so gracious for sharing those resources with us. You did an amazing job. What an honor. I will invite everyone um, now to enter any questions that you will have for um, Ms. Catherine um, today. And um, Naomi will uh, ask those questions. So feel free to um, enter those questions or if you would like to uh, speak for a second. I do believe um, Dr. Brown Barbara Brown had uh, an announcement that she wanted to say. Um, oh, but if you have any questions for uh, Ms. Catherine, I invite you to enter those in Thank now. you. Um, I hope you all can see this gibbet. When Paul Revere took his ride um, across the river, as before, as he crossed the river, the most likely path he would take would be past this gibbet and inside the gibbet was a man named Mark who had um, um, been killed by the state because he had murdered his cruel enslaver. And the gibbet was put up with his body inside in the 1750s so that all other enslaved people would know what might happen to them if they were out of line. And I can only imagine 
what it was like to be black in Boston, free or enslaved, and to see this. It comes from a wonderful book called Black Walden, which I bet Bob Bellinger knows about. <laughs> okay. Good handoff. Um, uh, thank you, Barbara, for that. What is the what was the um what, what did you refer to the uh uh, the harness that was on, I could use it. It's called a, I think it's called a gibbet. A gibbet. Um, yes, it's an eight, this is an 18th century gibbet. That's what it says in the text. Uh -huh. And what did that gibbet do? It, it, it hung us. Sorry, what, what are you asking? I, 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 I couldn't, I, from here I can't actually see what it did beside hanging. You put the, you put the body inside. And then leave it to rot. No, oh, okay. For decades. All right. Okay. I guess I get that. Thank you. It's terrible. And if anyone wants to read a little bit more about it, it's in this wonderful book published many years ago called Black Walden: okay. Slavery and Its Aftermath in Concord. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I recommend it highly. I, I would also add that Dr. Crumley produced a an episode of Illuminating the Unseen that discusses Mark, and um, and I would encourage folks to to watch that as well. Thank you for that. Great, mm -hmm. uh, Catherine. Um, the archival information at the Mass Historical Society. We are going to have uh, the Mass Historical Society uh, present in March, and we're also having a hybrid uh, relationship. We're going to have a bus available in Harvard Square for those who want to uh, attend in person at Mass Historical Society. But to the point of the question is that um, the information that uh, it would be nice if uh, we could ask them if they could highlight some of the information you're referring to, you know, uh, you, refer, you referred to in your presentation. And uh, so uh, uh, we can ask them about that you know so yeah, yeah you, yes I mean you can certainly we can request um that they bring out um you know pew records or or baptismal records and you'd be able to see in real life um yes some of the documents that I've shown you images of and I think that would be so rewarding there is nothing like actual history touching history yeah yes so that, that's great so those of you like to uh to join us on it for the March uh, virtual hybrid uh, at, to the Mass Historical Society. We'll have more information on that. Uh, I see Dr. Harris Gibson. Happy New Year, sir. New Year to you. Okay. Uh, just a comment about Mark that was mentioned because that, that should be known. Uh, Mark was a slave of John Codman, Captain John Codman. Mm -hmm. The Codman... Square is was the grandson of that man, and, and that 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 Codman was not a slaver; mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he was a minister. So, so just understand that. And secondly, uh, Mark Codman uh, uh, allegedly killed his owner, as was mentioned, and also Phyllis Codman was allegedly involved with that killing, uh, because Codman had promised them that they would be set free if they could afford to buy them, uh, buy, uh, pay him for themselves and uh, buy their freedom. And then he denied it when he had the money to do it. They were tried in Cambridge uh, for this uh, murder uh, in an area uh, called Avon Hill. At that time, it was called Gallows Row. Uh, it's about a, a mile south uh, west of uh, Porter Square. Uh, they burned Phyllis alive, where Codman, where, where Mark could see it. Then they hung him and then burned him and gibbeted him and brought him to an area at that time was called Charles Neck Gate. If you go from Union Square towards the ocean, you'll pass Holiday Inn uh, on your right. There's a hotel. That's where his body uh, was hung from 1755 until 1776. Uh, I think you should know that uh, as a part of the history of the area when you walk through it. 
and also know that all of the uh, legal bodies who were involved with his uh, finding of being, being guilty were Harvard lawyers. The defense attorney was a Harvard lawyer, and all of the three who made the decision to have them both killed were also Harvard lawyers. Perhaps it's a form of lynching, Boston lynching. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Gibson. Um, Catherine, in terms of your, well, does, first of all, anyone else have their hand up? Naomi, do you have any no, questions? Naomi, there's some questions. I think there are question some in questions in the chat I can get to, um, but also following up on um, the case of Mark and Phyllis, there is an online PDF that is, is a record of their trial that is available online um, if folks actually want to go through and read the court document. Um, you can just Google that and that'll come up. Um, but for uh, questions in the chat, uh, Carol Hector Harris asks, uh, where did the cocoa come from? Uh, referring to Captain Jackson in the beginning. Yeah, it was coming from the Caribbean. So uh, it was coming from, I believe, Suriname. Um, and we know that at least one of the plantations from which cacao was coming was owned by one of the members of the royal family or his wife um, called Fairfield. Uh, so yes, I mean, cacao is grown in a very narrow swath around the equator. So, uh, that kind of dictates where it was being traded from. Okay. Um, Naomi. Um, as people are thinking of questions, I actually have a question as well. Um, you mentioned in 2019, sort of when that shift in interpretation happened, um, you consulted with um, advisors and researchers. And I think in this audience, we do have quite a few folks who are also engaged in this sort of research and sort of shifting their own interpretation. So I'm wondering if you have any advice or um, kind of the most valuable insight you have um, for those folks um, after going through that process. So yeah, it was a long process. I mean, of course we had, you know, this this research discovering in 2019 that just was a watershed moment for our site. Um, speaking personally, I would say that uh, our decision to simply follow the research and follow the facts and be extremely transparent about it and also, um, to not proceed from a place of defensiveness, I guess. I think just accepting that this is part of the history of our site was, was very important because we just put our heads down and started to do the work. And that was, um, and that's been our process ever since. We look for the smartest people to help us because nobody, <laughs> um, nobody knows everything. Uh, but we have been truly very fortunate to work with professionals, consultants, and experts in the field who have educated all of us at Old North um, and helped us to educate our uh, frontline staff because these are conversations that are um, really challenging to have with visitors who come expecting a story of, you know, a, a ride and and um, a lantern signal and leave having heard something that is is far more complicated than that. And then we have another question from Carla. Mm -hmm. um, Carla asks, how did Old North Church deal with discussions on abolition in their congregation? That is a topic that we would really like to get into. Um, we don't, we simply don't really know. Um, we need to dive into the, not only our own ar archives, but it may require that we um, employ some more wide ranging research techniques to find out what people in the congregation were doing during the discussions around abolition. Uh, what were the activities of the church? Where was any sort of philanthropic money going? But yes, I think that is a critical next step in our understanding of our site's history. 
doing. Um, um, then, a very brief yeah. question. Um, were there any people opposed to slavery at the time of slavery in your congregation? I do not know personally of any stories of that. Um, I do know that the first rector of the church, um, Timothy Cutler, was a, um, basically, he was also a missionary of the Society for the Pro Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, which was one of its, um, his uh, focuses was on the conversion of Black and Indigenous people to Christianity, specifically to Anglican, the Anglican faith. Um, but that was not rooted in a sense of equality or um, any sort of desire for um, abolition, per se. He himself enslaved someone in his home. Um, he seemed to feel that he could reconcile his religious beliefs and um, the institution of slavery. Um, and I'll just read a couple of the comments that came in. Um, Laura Roberts says that Jared Hardesty's research was also central to the exhibit we're, we're learning about next month. Um, so we'll learn more about that. And then Ellen Hume says the congregation is vitally engaged now with this. Um, I wonder, Catherine, if you know anything about that. I know Old North Illuminated and the congregation are separate entities, so I'm not sure how much you know about that. Well, I, I would never speak for the congregation. Um, the congregation is partnering. My only understanding, which I actually just had a meeting this morning and was, we were talking about it, um, is that they are partnering with Christ Church in Cambridge and um, they've been doing a program of work together. But in terms of their, their particular journey, um, you know, I would want them to speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's. Oh, uh, Holly, you had a comment about that. Did you want to share more about that? Hey, just a quick comment. I am, I'm the deacon at Old North Church and thank you, Catherine. That was a great presentation. Um, and we are engaged in these discussions in a, uh, Episcopal wide curriculum called Sacred Ground. Um, that also encourages us to look at our own local history. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's interesting to know because we are in discussion. I see Ted Hammer here from Christ Church in Cambridge, but uh, <laughs> um, Slave Legacy History Coalition is in contact with uh, uh, Christ Church and we have been on a few projects in the past. So that's nice to know of that synergy that's taking place. Yeah, <laughs> Louise is here too, Louise Ambler. Oh, I didn't see, yes, Louise. Hello, Louise. Hi, Louise. <laughs> um, Dennis, uh, yeah, just okay. uh, the Sacred Ground is a curriculum, an anti-racism curriculum, curriculum from the National Church. And um, at Christ Church Cambridge, we have, done uh, a, uh, cir two circles of sacred ground our own uh, of our own and then following up on that where now we now have two more um, circles of sacred ground together with old north so that those are composed of members of both parishes working together okay it's very interesting well, we appreciate that. Um, for those of you who have not, well, I know uh, Naomi and Egypt will have some comments, I'm sure. But uh, for those of you who have not visited uh, Old North Illuminary and taken a tour of the facility, you sh it's it's a wonderful historical uh, entry into what took place during that time period. And <clears throat> the restoration of their crypt site uh, is you know, something to, to see, uh, and which has a history unto itself. And how many people are interred there? 1,100. Oh, <laughs> right on top of Beacon Hill, geez. I mean, on top of uh, uh, 
what is it, Cobbs Hill? That's not yeah. So yeah, so there's the Cobbs Hill burying ground, but then our just below our church, yes, the crypt contains the remains of eleven hundred folks. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That 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 is quite interesting, and it uh, the restoration of that area has was you know very uh, excellent job to preserve you know the history of that particular area of the church. So, I think Ted wanted to say something. Ted, did yeah, you no, want no. To yeah, thanks. Speaking speaking of burials, you you all probably know that that Darby Basil is buried under Christ Church, Cambridge, and one. And we're in the process of updating our historical signage and historical narratives um, along those lines of and related related matters. But just something that I just learned from uh, a, a newspaper uh, report that um, Brandon Chambers, the co-chair of our church's uh, reparations committee, shared with me is that Darby Vassal was actually buried under Christ Church on October 15th, 1861, which was the 100th anniversary of the first service held at Christ Church on October 15th, 1761. And it was part of the celebration of the centennial, which was going on uh, at that very time. So that's, a, I think, a really interesting fact that we're going to in, uh, include in our in our historical signage and historical narratives. Thank you. Wow, that's great. Thank you, Ted. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we're coming up on the hour. Um, I want to be respectful for everyone's time. Um, uh, Catherine, thank you again so much for uh, this wonderful um, meeting today, for sure, sharing your resources with us. Uh, we look forward to um, to everyone, as Naomi said, our meeting next month is going to be with uh, Kiara Singleton and Joseph Backley, and they will talk about the exhibit at Fanu Hall. So that will be an excited um, presentation. And then we're looking forward to that hybrid meeting at the Massachusetts Historical Society in March. Um, also, uh, for everyone that does not know, we uh, record our meetings and if you would like to see our past in um, meetings, they are uploaded on our YouTube channel as well. And our next um, events that will be coming up are on our event page on our website at www.slavelegacyhistorycoalition.org. Um, before I dismiss anyone, Dad, did you have anything that you wanted to say? Uh, no, thank you to all. Um, it's wonderful to see each other from the start of the year uh, and so many Paula, thank you for your your comments. Always a wonderful uh, uh, encounter, you know, with you. And thank you for the work you did on the renaming of the uh, uh, the Vassal Upper Lane School to the Dobby Vassal uh, School, renaming of it. Wonderful job. Uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, uh, Robin, I saw him. Uh, Brian, Robin, uh, thank you, Louise. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone. And there's so many people. We so, look forward to seeing you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good uh, to see it. Oh, well. I just wanted to mention one thing too. Uh, yeah. Remember, we will be sending out something on the event that will take place on uh, February 12th at uh, uh, First Church First in Cambridge, Church. and that will uh, feature um, three. Uh, uh, yeah, three noted. Carrie Greenwich. Yes, uh, Carrie Greenwich. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he lost his connection. Um, but that event will be, um, oh, there you go, um, mm -hmm. listed on our website. Um, if you want to know more information about the 10 million names, that would be on February the 12th. Yes. And, and I would encourage everyone to attend. It will be a very, very uh, interesting presentation. Uh, and where the uh, 10 million uh, names project will be uh, explained. And you can learn a lot about uh, what has taken place and where they are going. So, yes. Egypt, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, again. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Goodbye. You. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Brian, Bye. take care. Bob, always a pleasure. Uh, Robin, take care. Bye, Dr.